But I did it. I moved forward and uh, I pursued my internet ministry, social media ministry, again, that people criticized and laughed at. In fact, people told me I was going to go to hell for playing with God. You ain't gonna, how you going to have ministry on the computer? How you going to do this on the internet? People ain't going to sit and listen to you on, online, you know? And uh, here we are today. <laughs> Our special guest today is Pastor Marcus Gill. He's an author, an entrepreneur, an influencer. He's a kingdom renaissance man. He's my friend, and we're glad to have him today. Marcus Gill, my brother. How you doing, man? I'm great. I'm great. Minus all the quarantining and sitting still. I, I'd rather have cabin fever than to have the other fever. So you're right. You're right, man. Six feet away instead of six feet under. Yes, sir. <laughs> you know, That's right. That's right. I, I, the social distancing is is a little strange for me, but I'm an ambivert, so I yes, can sir. I can rock either way. You know, I can sit home and write a book, read a book, or I can yep. go out and and you know being a crowd of people. I don't, I don't mind either, but I thank God for the safety of your family and your lovely wife. And, yes, sir. and um, I'm still a tad jealous about, about the weather patterns in South Carolina, but you know. Hey, listen, Myrtle, Myrtle Beach is the place to be right now. It was literally like 85 and like breezy. Mm, it's Sunny, rubbing. nice it's and clear skies. <laughs> just rubbing in, it's all good. The beach is closed though, but we can look at it. We just can't. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right, you can look at it from a window. Here's my concept. Right. It, you know, they're fine. You know, I can look at it just like you. So I'm gonna go on yes, the web and search Myrtle Beach, man. But um, yo, you are an insp inspiration to me, man. Um, we met. We grew up in the same hometown. Um, yeah. you know, your your heritage, your family is my family of sense. I mean, we we all grew up together. You're a little younger than me, you know. Um, yeah. But uh. You know, when when we met, you were pastoring up here, and um, what an what an interesting um, transition you were going through at that time. And man, but the transformation of God on your life since that season that, that you didn't break under the pressure of that man. What was what most remarkable about that time we actually connected? You know, I think uh, the most remarkable thing about that season, and I remember it quite clearly because I was in a place that time I was just pursuing pursuing, pursuing, pursuing. You know, I was at a place where, you know, how a certain city or certain area can have a reputation that nothing good can come out and nothing good is happening. And, you know, you can be like me, a young guy, and I'm just pursuing, I'm pursuing that name to be like, I'm going to be the one that's going to shift this thing. I'm going to be the one to change this thing. And, and it was looking like that was happening. You know, it was looking like it. But I've also learned that, you know, uh, we're not the ones who have the power to change a thing. And, Connecting with you, you probably don't even realize this, but you taught me how to recognize that it ain't about you at all. <laughs> it ain't about an individual being the hero to change and shift nothing in the kingdom. And I don't even know if you realize it, but your language alone, it wasn't like you rebuked me and said, no, nah, you need to sit your behind down, young man. You're thinking too big of yourself. <laughs> but your language, <laughs> you know, your language. Uh, I remember the first time we talked, it was a Monday. And, uh, you know, we're used to pastors, you know, Monday's off, right? Mm -hmm. And I remember saying to you on the call, and I said, I'm so sorry to call you. I know this is probably a day off. And you said to me, no, nah, man, ain't no days off with me. Ain't no <laughs> days off with my assignment. And mm -hmm. that thing stuck with me for the rest of my ministry. Like, till this day, I take no breaks. Like, I, I, I find a minute, but even in my breaking, if I need to react or respond, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying, nah, this is my day off. I'm chilling. Uh -uh, not today. No, I get up and I do what I have to do. And that was a that was a shifting season for me. My mindset shifted. And I think that's the most valuable thing that has happened in that time. Uh, what I was pursuing and how I was pursuing it and the mm -hmm. mindset shift that took place through relationship with you and conversation with you. That was the most important thing that happened to me in that season, and I'm grateful for it. And yeah, that was that was a three hour call, and uh, you know, but yep, I remember <laughs> it, was, it was it was momentous for me to be able to share yeah. with um with with you know someone with such potential, and here we are, almost a decade later, 
you know, and and it it's, it seems like wow. seems like um, God has has gotten you and you and I both on the course that we should be on at this point, you know. And I had just at that time come through something really tough, um, you know, in in getting established in my assignment. And there's always great adversity when you've shifted levels, you know. There's a it's a different protocol. Yeah. It's, a, it's and so. Um, you know, having iron to sharpen iron during that season is real important, man. But um, you passed it for some time after that, and then and 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 then God shifted. Um, m many people never are able to make that shift because in their mind they're not able to to kind of comprehend that it's still in the will of God. How did you make the shift from being a senior pastor and starting churches and planting churches and taking over the legacy of your of your grandfather and all those things that you did? How did you make the shift to now you, the the ministry that you're doing? Well, first of all, let's just be honest, total honest. And I think this is what this broadcast is about anyway. I was failing. <laughs> it just wasn't working. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't growing. There was no uh, stick to to the vision. I didn't have the right level of influence. I didn't even have the wisdom to do what I thought I had the wisdom to do. And so it was real easy to give up or, or so to speak, or say, you know what, this is not for me. I, I, I wasn't called to this. I, I thought I was called to it, but I wasn't because it was, it was failing. Uh, it just wasn't working. It was, it was stupid, you know, uh, as far as <laughs> me thinking that I <laughs> somebody that I wasn't. And that's, hey, let's just be real. I was looking at the cafeteria that I was using in New Haven, and I got tired of looking at all them seats and setting up all them chairs and, you know, not having no money to even pay for the place. Uh, and people lying to me, talking about they was going to give and they wouldn't give it and <laughs> They was going to show up. I was showing up for service an hour early, me and uh, my guy, Deacon Amos, to set up. And the people, I was driving an hour and 45 minutes from Newburgh because I was still trying to leave my grandfather's church. Mm -hmm. And I was doing that service at 11 and then getting to my service in New Haven for 3 o'clock. And the people that lived locally, that lived maybe two blocks from where we were having service, they showing up 45 minutes late. Oh. And I'm coming <laughs> an hour and 45 minutes. You know, it's, it was like, okay. So the handwriting was on the wall. Like this, this just isn't working. So that's first. It ain't nothing deep and spiritual about it. I just recognize, like I wish many other folks would recognize. Whoa, it's not working. God still gave me wisdom in that season to recognize my assignment. Mm -hmm. I had enough wisdom to realize that uh, long suffering was not wisdom for that situation. Mm. You know, that wasn't me trusting God. That was me trusting in myself, trying to force something to happen that I dreamed of. So mm -hmm. that was the first thing. And then the second thing, I began to realize that the assignment that I had on my life to reach people was working on the Internet and mm -hmm. through videos, and through social media and through blogging. Before I wrote any books, I was blogging and just kind of writing uh, inspirational messages online for people to read and that's what opened the door to me you know realizing i could turn this stuff into books i can start writing books you know mm -hmm. and so i recognized what wasn't working and i recognized what was working and uh besides being embarrassed and having to say we're going to close the church and then want to knowing that people were going to talk about me and laugh and say oh we knew he wasn't going to be nothing you know uh it was a struggle to close it down but i did it i moved forward and uh, I pursued my internet ministry, social media ministry, again, mm -hmm. that people criticized and laughed at. Mm -hmm. In fact, people told me I was going to go to hell for playing with God. You ain't gonna, how are you going to have ministry on the computer? How are you going to do this on the internet? People ain't going to sit and listen to you on, on, online, you know? And uh, here we are today. <laughs> well, how, how did that go, you know? Yeah, yeah so two, two and a half million people later, television broadcast, radio broadcast, best-selling books, crusades, ministry all over the world, and and partners all over the world, and they are appreciating this. And now we're in this time where every pastor is now preaching in a place other than his pulpit. Wow. And so as a, so, as a juggernaut, as a trailblazer, um, you know, you're the, you're the tip of the diamond, you know, that um, they laughed at you. Now they, now they imitate you. You know, I Literally. mean, that's not arrogant. Text mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've gotten text messages from pastors. They've literally hit me up to apologize for mm -hmm. things they said to me two and three years ago about social media ministry. And, uh, and of course, I accept the apology, but the apology is followed by, 
Now, can you tell me how to such and such? <laughs> right, right. You know, and, and, I, and I help them. I go right into it. I help them because I'm glad to see that they're willing to accept this way of expanding their ministry. Right. And so, you know, being an early adopter and, and well, before I get to early adoption, because uh, I think that's really the point is that sometimes uh, those who, who pick up technology, pick up the next move before it happens, you look foolish to those who are who are clueless. Mm -hmm. But eventually it all makes sense. Mm -hmm. And and that's that's just a, a pattern of life. Oh, yeah. Um, but I think one of the strengths of your character is the ability to assess when something's not working and 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 to take the hit early so that you can invest your energy in what's going to work for you. Yeah, I think he just gave me the wisdom and the, the, the heart and even the, the grit to be able to deal with failure, uh -huh. you know, so that I can just say, okay, that failed. Now it's time to try something new so that can succeed. Right. So failure is not an end to you. Uh, it is, it's actually a, a shifting point. It's, a, it's okay. It's not a period. It's a comma. You know, I can shift directions or whatever sure. I need to do That's here, right. but basically it, it, it's not a judgment of me. It's a judgment of what I was doing. Right. Man, That's I need to write that in my phone real quick. It's <laughs> not a period. Um, I like that because you can keep going. Wow, that's deep. That's deep. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, we, swear, we, I got that. So, um, you know, we had a conversation, Marcus, about um, about how I saw your ministry as the ministry of Barnabas. And, um, you know, in my studies of the book of Acts, um, you know, it was Paul and Barnabas, you know, oh, Barnabas and Paul, Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul. And then there was a shift, but I understood his ministry. His name means son of consolation. And I thought that, I thought that was a great way to, to categorize your ministry of exhortation on the online sure. and everyone may not understand it. How did that conversation uh, impact you? In a big way. And I'll tell you why, because all my life, I always kind of see myself as David, uh, because I'm a musician as well. And I know David was a musician, an altar as well, writer as well, king, uh, failure as well, you know, warrior. And I would always see myself as David. And um, it wasn't until we had that conversation one time when I was at a place, I was kind of at a crossroads of not feeling valuable. And, uh, you know, because there are certain gifts in the body of Christ that people celebrate more than others. And uh, no, where do we get this idea that one gift and one, one anointing or whatever is supposed to be, oh, we're going to pay more attention to that one. This is mm -hmm. the person that gets more attention. This is the person that gets invited more. And, and why is that? And so you start trying to feel like, man, maybe I need to start prophesying every time I get up to a mic. And, you know, because that seems to be the thing that everybody loves and wants. And mm -hmm. our conversation, you said, well, brother, he said, man, you're an encourager. He said, that's an anointing, you know? And you told me, you said, you know, look at Barnabas. And I had known Barnabas, but I had never connected the two. Mm -hmm. And I never connected the gift of being an encourager with the fact that that's what God blessed me to do. That's why I'm reaching the masses, not because I'm prophesying or hooping like everybody else or, you know, doing what, what, what the popular thing is. But my ministry is blessed because I am an encourager. And so, man, I started digging about Barnabas and reading about Barnabas, and I started seeing so many uh, similar traits that Barnabas carried that I carry today. And mm -hmm. so I was so grateful to this day. Anytime people say, who do you see yourself as in the Bible? I say Barnabas. And some people say, who is that? We don't hear much about him. And I'm able to explain to them who Barnabas was and what he carried and the type of impact he made in the world while he was here. Well, I thank you for that. And in the same way, you get to explain who you are to me and who you are to so many of our friends, because uh, you are an encourager and uh, you are a uh, a a almost um, I, you know the optimism of your life is infectious, you know, and um, and of course in doing what we do, um, you still there, Marcus? Um, so you you have a you have this infectious uh, optimism about you that that is so needed in ministry because many times what we're faced with we we don't come in contact with people until they're in crisis a lot of times and so um, sometimes even in in our churches we be we become uh, infatuated with the problem 
and we get a response from the audience but not realizing that our optimism has been decreased by that and so having having mm -hmm. um uh, Barnabases in the body of Christ, sons of consolation, who are able to give, um, you know, word, forward looking words, man, is, is really important. And so your gift is valuable, uh, the exhorter, as well as the teacher in you. And so we thank God for that in you. Um, one of the things that, that I wanted to talk to you about today was how how your your business acumen and, and your ability to identify the internet and those things as as mediums for you to spread the message and to have influence where you didn't have to put up chairs. And I think this was really the point. I could have church and give my message and not set up chairs in the cafeteria, <laughs> you know, because who, who's going to put up two million chairs? Um, you know, but how is that freedom? <laughs> how did how how have you utilized, <laughs> how have you used utilize hey, the freedom? Hey. And I'm telling you, it was such a you know, it was a dream I had. And and let me not confuse nobody on this. I wanna I wanna be sure you understand I have a service where I need two million chairs out. Like I would love to have a crusade like that. And you know, it's it's being done over in Africa and yeah, I've seen it and, in, Nigeria, and parts yeah. of uh, Nigeria. Ghana, it's happening. Like jokers are having service two point three three million people in a in an airfield and all that. So I know that it's right. possible over in India. It's, yeah, Reinhard Bonke, uh Chris Ayakilomi, Benny Hinn is some. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, Dag, Dag Hayward Mills. Yeah, uh, I preach that. that just, Dag Hayward Mills. Yes, yes, yes. Um, uh, there's another man. Uh, his name is uh, Ad Ad Adeboye um, yeah, from, Nigeria. Yeah, from Nigeria. Millions of time. But mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's, it's powerful. And I, I spoke to the Lord sometime ago. I said one day, I said, I want to be able to, I want to be able to gather a million crusade, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about it. I'm seeing myself on a big stage and preaching and I'm seeing a big crowd. And after a while, I grew my page a million people. And at that Facebook, you know, Growing a page to a million people as a preacher was unheard of. That's why I ended up getting all on TV and all this crazy stuff running because it was just bizarre. Mm -hmm. And then the Lord hit me and said, your dream just came through. Your dream just came true. And I'm like, okay, Lord, but I want the chairs. Lord kept saying, your dream just came true. So celebrate that. Mm -hmm. And it's like now I realize it needed to be celebrated so much because if you look at the times now, our new normal is going to be digitally focused. Absolutely. And uh, being able to, to pull that many people online, just being real, mm -hmm. just speaking the language of the people. You know, mm -hmm. I was telling folks, don't get on social media and try to post your whole sermon as your status. Nobody's going to sit and read that whole thing. Nobody reading all 20 of your points in one post. No, you're not. You know, uh, uh, don't get up on there. <laughs> Go on videos rebuking people and casting the devil out. You can't, you're not going to cast the devil out via uh, Facebook or Instagram, you know, because you think that's your ministry. You know, it's mm -hmm. not going to work. And the Lord showed me, he said, people get online because they want to, they want to get on the computer to, to escape from, they trying to escape activity, They're scrolling through, looking for something funny, scroll through and get an actual word that's going to empower them and mm -hmm. change their life. And, and so you know, into consideration going to the beach and having a nice backdrop, always get dressed nice for the videos, stuff that people, nobody was doing, mm -hmm. making sure that all my memes were professionally uh, cut and, 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 and the graphics were sharp, you know, and clean. You know, after a while, some of the big preachers, the big heroes, the fathers that we all call the generals, mm -hmm. their team started getting a hold of what I was doing. And then it started being duplicated across the social media pages. And so I'm for, for it opened the door for so many other things uh, in business. Uh, we own pub company, our own video media company. Um, we, of course, we support charities from all around the world, and we support uh, schools. We, I mean, we're doing so many things. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, I just recently broke into sports entertainment, low key, uh, oh. here locally in Myrtle Beach. And so, right, there's some the things I've been posting here and there about that, but we, we're going to extend that. And it's going to just, continue. yeah, yeah. So we're going to let that second. start with it. I don't know what's going on. I, I've been doing these Zoom calls. Yeah, well, this one, this one is, uh, this one this is, is very annoying. 
Yeah, it's anointing. You got all that energy. You got all of that uh, that uh, anointing flowing through you. It's it's interfering <laughs> with the electromagnetic signals. <laughs> the five G uh, from your Wi Fi. It's stronger than five G. It's disturbing it. So so you you're a businessman. You own a publishing company. You own a media company. You you got charities that you support all over the world. And uh, now some sports entertainment stuff you're doing right there in Myrtle Beach, man. Mm -hmm. Um, you use your media platform and the and the resources that it provides to do some great work, and it it you can't do that without those resources. How how is that freedom so important? Why is that freedom so important for for anyone? Well, you know, because you're not limited to somebody else's rule. Uh, you know, I meet so many people that are so gifted, talented, anointed, teams got vision and have great wisdom. <clears throat> but they don't have the ability to create their own flow. <clears throat> and because of that, they have to be responsible for somebody else's flow. Mm. And when you're responsible for somebody else's flow, you're drained when you're done. And then you have no energy. You don't have no zeal to complete what you got to do for yourself because all you want to do now is go to sleep and you got to focus so much on perfecting how you're perfecting somebody else's flow so that you don't lose that so mm -hmm. that you can eat. And I always tell people, I say, you're going to have to, you have to drain yourself mm -hmm. until you can get to the place to where you don't have to depend on somebody else's income anymore. And you know what, for me, it was really humbling because, and then sometimes you just got to do what you got to do. Mm -hmm. If you are in your twenties and your thirties and you have a family member that's willing to let you live with them. So you don't have to pay no bills so that you can get on your feet and get your flow going, mm -hmm. humble yourself and do that. Do it. I did it. I moved in my grandparents attic. After having, I had my own crib, my own cars, all that kind of stuff, doing my thing, building somebody else's vision, but getting paid enough for it. And I had to let it all go. And I moved in with them so that I could, I could begin to shift and begin to turn to what it is that I want to create. You know, I couldn't get up and go do no videos on the beach and I had a job, you know? So I had the freedom to take an hour drive to, you know, uh, Atlantic beach in New York city from Newburgh and do a bunch of videos all day so that I can post them, you know, every week and mm -hmm. have content so that I can hope that somebody will see it and be blessed by it. Mm -hmm. And wasn't making no money. Wasn't getting no TV deals, no book deals. You know, I was probably getting $75 when I would go somewhere and preach, you know, that was my little income. I would, <laughs> I would put it in the bank. You know what I'm saying? Then I, I went and started working at the boys and girls club and this was wisdom too, because I took that job because that was ministry to me. Mm -hmm. That gave me the opportunity to be doing what I wanted to do, which was inspiring young people at that time, mm -hmm. inspiring mm -hmm. young people. And so even at that, the boss there, a guy named Kevin White, great man. He could give me access to professional video cameras, mm -hmm. music equipment, because I was teaching the media and I was teaching them how to do music and recording. So he said, hey, you got the key. If you ever want to use this stuff for your own good, so be it. And so I was able to record my videos with nice cameras that I couldn't afford. I was able to record music in the studio with equipment that I couldn't afford, but it opened the door for access. Mm -hmm. And I was able to build my empire or at least start it because mm -hmm. I put myself in the position to be able to use resources that were around me. Wow. And some folks won't humble themselves now for that. They say, oh, I ain't moving in with nobody. I'm not taking no, no little small job like that. And we don't realize that those are the stepping stones to be able to now I can send them whatever they need. I call them and say, what do y'all need for this program? Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a special check from MGI. That's a blessing. You know? And that's what it was in Girls Club in, in Yonkers. Newburgh. I mean, in Newburgh, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah I used to work there. Yep. And, yep. And Glenn Hines, Glenn Hines. Glenn Hines, right on Liberty Street. Yeah, that's right, man. Across the street yeah. from where my father grew up, where I was conceived. <laughs> Wow, wow, right on Chamber Street. Yep, yep. <laughs> Love, yeah. uh, Liberty Street. Yeah, 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 right there yeah. On, the bricks, on the bricks right there. Yes, sir. Something, man. It's yes, remarkable sir. how how I, they call them God winks, you know, how God, wow. he, he does certain things in your life to put you in position that if you, again, if you're obedient and humble, you, mm -hmm. you actually catch the opportunity and you use it as a platform, man. And yes, and to connect you to home and to your into your history, man. I see it all the time. I remember I did a revival in Pocomoke, Maryland. Mm. And I, the people, it was the University of Maryland Eastern Shore had come to my church, and um, 
they, to sing at Beulah in Poughkeepsie. And um, literally, they sat in my Sunday school class, heard me teach, and was like, yo, can you come and do such and such at our university? And of course, you can preach at the church. And I'm like, yeah, fine. I drive down to Pocomoke, and I'm preaching. I go, why does this town sound familiar? And it's actually the town where my grandparents were born. Wow. I had never been there. The church I was preaching at was my family's church. Half the people were my family in the congregation. I had no idea. That's crazy. God will. He'll direct your path yeah. in certain ways and just wow. bless you it's while you're obeying them. It's yes, a sir. Thing. So yes, sir. Um, we had this conversation the other day. And again, this is about your unique ministry. And, and um, you're a musician. And we, we got to jam a couple weeks. Maybe I'll put a clip of us jamming. Oh, on, that's on, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, so we, you're a musician and you got all of these gifts and talents, but your, your, your primary focus is your, your worldwide ministry to, to spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ in your unique way. But the church is not always that supportive. How, you know, and we talked about, you still there? We talked about how, yep, how, how short sighted the church is. And, you know, at many of your events, um, many of the people there, they don't even, they're not even believers yet. And how, how do you handle that? And you're right. The church can be non-supportive. Like, that's all facts. And it's, it's so surprising how the church can be that way. And it's disappointing. Let me just say that. Uh, mm -hmm. It's heartbreaking. Uh, but I remember the first time it happened, I was doing a service actually in New Haven, Connecticut. And uh, there was a brother that kept coming. And uh, I noticed my kept coming. I said, hey, hey, man of God, you know, I'm so glad that you've been with us. You've been visiting, man. Where, where are you from? And he said, well, first of all, I don't consider myself a man of God. So I was confused in that moment because when he told me he was a Buddhist and I didn't, I didn't tell him, oh, no, listen, you, we need to talk. You know, I, I, I thanked him for coming and I appreciated his time. And I asked my grand, I said, you know, if that man is coming because he's enjoying the word, but he has not made a decision to become a Christian, if he happens to die in a car accident right after my service, say he's driving and he calls somebody, man, I'm listening to this preacher. He's awesome. I've never been interested in Christianity, but for some reason I'm drawn to this guy's ministry and I've been going to this church and he dies in the car. Will that man go to hell? I, I really felt in my heart that there's a level of grace that would be with a man like that mm -hmm. because there's something in him that's wanting to make a decision. Mm -hmm. But he's not doing it how we do it, how it's like you show up and you're supposed to do it right now. Mm -hmm. But yet this man in his mind, he's saying, you know what? I want to get connected to this. I I've been a Buddhist all my life, he told me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what if this man is coming and coming and coming and he's coming because he wants to learn? He's 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 taking it in and he's he's appreciating it and he's respecting it. Well, long story short, it started happening more and more and more. I started noticing that some of the very people that even support my ministry financially, they're Muslims, you know, like Nation of Islam Muslims, <laughs> straight up, you know. Um, and then there's, there's, there's Muslims that are from like uh, different parts of the world, Pakistan, and, you know, they follow me and they're like, hey, I'm a Muslim, but I'm a partner in your ministry. I love your messages. Uh, I started even seeing atheists that would come and they would come in line, take a selfie with me. And, they, and I'd say, hey, where's your church? Hey, man, I don't go to church, but I believe in your message. Mm. thing was bugging me out because I'm like, is God going to beat me up because these people aren't leaving my meeting saved? Mm. Or am I doing the right thing by allowing them to come and make the decision for themselves? Mm -hmm. People ate me up about it. How in the world you got Buddhists and atheists and Muslims and non-believers coming to your services and some of them getting saved and then others are leaving just as happy as they can be. They should feel convicted. They should feel beat up. You know, so I'm saying, how do we know that they don't feel convicted? How, yeah. how, do we, how do you know that they're not coming because they're not just going to jump into it just because your mom or your daddy said it like you got safe, but right. they're going to jump into it because they want to come and learn and they want to grow. And what I'm saying is affecting them. The scripture says that um, Paul, you know, so Paul planted or Apollos, you know, and, and Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. God gave and, the increase. And right. when we see ourselves as a part of a of a team that, mm -hmm. that gets the will of God um, accomplished in the earth, 
then mm -hmm. we don't have to worry about the results. The results are not our problem. Nope. We're looking at stats and measuring ourselves against ourselves. The scripture says that's not wise. You right. measure yourself, measure yourself against Jesus. And I got a lot of work to do before I get there. Woo! A whole but, lot. But it's so powerful to see how you embrace your ministry. And um, you have been, uh, for me, what you say I've been for you, just um, an inspiration and uh, and a powerful motivating force for me to keep pressing into what God is doing for me, um, going a, a little different direction because most of my stuff is going to be interviews, you know, and this Kingdom Renaissance Man uh, yeah. show is really about empowering men. And I think that your message and your life, it, your testimony is, is going to help a lot of men to come to the place where their failure doesn't define them. It's just a moment. It defines a moment, not me. That's right. And That's so, right. Um, one, I got two last questions for you, and then I think we, I think we can um, for the day. You know. All right. Yeah. I'm about to say do fifty more. We'll split it up. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. So, so why is it so important to you personally, not the preacher, but Marcus Gill, the man? Why is it so important to you? to follow Christ? Man, that's, that's a, that's an easy question to answer. I really believe the Bible and I really believe that the only way we could live our best life is to be a follower of Christ. Uh -huh. Simply put, that's, I don't believe I would be able to have any level of success, no taste of prosperity if it wasn't for the fact that Jesus is in my heart and I follow him and I follow his word. That's, that's why it's important for me and to have success and prosperity in every area of my life is dependent upon me following Christ. And I deeply, I surely believe that. Wow. Yeah. I, I can only live my best life as a man by following mm -hmm. Christ. Yes, sir. He bring hit the purpose he brings to me is what, is what makes me valuable. Yes, sir. That's wonderful, man. That's wonderful. Yes. Um, can you pray for the people? And then we're going to talk about, about something else after that. But can you pray for the men who are watching? And, and... Yeah. So, you know, at this moment, I believe that this is a moment, a shifting moment. This conversation has been a conversation to encourage you. But one thing that I believe deep down on the inside is that one word can shift your life. One word can shift your mind. One word can shift your heart and the power that a man's testimony has to let you know that you're not the only one that is dealing with what you've dealt with or what you're dealing with now. But to see two men that have overcome so many obstacles were proof that the obstacle that you're going through and the obstacle that you're facing right now, it's not going to last forever. In fact, that obstacle will become a stepping stone. And I want to pray for you right now that the Lord would open doors in your life that no man can shut that God would give you the ability to stand through any storm. He'd give you the ability to stand through this season. I pray that you would have wisdom and prophetic insight as it concerns your next moves that are going to benefit not only you, but will benefit you and your whole family. I pray that your hands will be blessed and that everything that you touch will prosper. In the name of Jesus, your health, your finances, your self-esteem, your spirit, man, I decree and declare that God is strengthening you and he's empowering you for life and for service. And I pray that even now and in the next week, in the next month, we'll be filled with bliss, increase, wisdom, and opportunities that will position you to prosper and be blessed in every area of your life. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen. 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 And amen. My brother. Amen. Your anointing uh, is... Uh is in undeniable i thank god for our friendship and our family's friendship yes and, sir you know what god is doing in your life um you got a new book you just wrote um yeah. you know where you got it there near you or i saw the sign on the other side of the room oh man i done moved i done moved around and if i move the camera it's gonna uh <laughs> it's gonna mess up but not but tell us about the new book and i'll, I'll put it yeah. up i'll put up the yeah book. my newest book is called uh, i see more love and it's a book where I'm giving nine wisdom keys on how to use the love of God to prosper you in every area of your life. In fact, my, my main objective in the book is to help people understand that we should be uh, demonstrating love uh, with no pursuit for personal gain. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that book, I'm talking about how to agree to disagree, 
how to increase your levels of loyalty, how to celebrate other people's victories as if they're your own, and so much more. Uh, this book is a perspective book. And when I say perspective book, uh, if you are reading it and you are concerned about your relationship with your spouse, it'll work. If you're reading it and you're concerned about your relationship with your fellow church members, it'll work. If you're reading it and you're concerned about your relationship uh, with your friends or coworkers, it works. It's all about demonstrating love. And so every area of our life where we deal with our uh, interpersonal relationships, mm -hmm. this book will be a blessing. If you get a hold of it, it'll be one of your favorite books, I promise. You'll keep it in your purse or, or not your purse, it's a men's program. You'll keep it in your briefcase. I have to talk about the ladies right now. I was going to include everybody, but uh, <laughs> you'll, you'll hold it. And it, it's a great book for if you're getting ready to deal with a conflict with somebody. Mm -hmm. And you, you can read this book, and I'm going to teach you how to communicate and how to really demonstrate love even in those conflicting moments so wow. that things can smooth over well. So God gave it to me some time ago when I was preaching a sermon at my church in St. Louis, a sermon series. And I uh, said, you know, I need to turn this into a book so that people can hold it and it can help them prepare for some uh, interpersonal relationship uh, situations that they'll need to face. Oh, I'm definitely, um, they can go to your website, Marcus, yes. Marcus Gill. Uh, MarcusGillInternational.org mm -hmm. or you can just go to MarcusGill.tv and uh, click the books links and uh, you'll be able to get that book and you'll be able to see other books that are available from me and friends. Actually, I got Pastor Hassel's book listed on our friends list as well on our gillhousebooks.com website. So check out all of them. To me, man. I got another one coming out. We're actually digging through it right now soon. Oh, soon. man, I can't wait. Yeah, yeah, man. But, yo, man, I love you, man, with all that sent me. Love you, bro. No prayers for you and your family. And, um, yes, sir. And, and uh, all the blessings that are happening for you, man. I can't wait. I can't wait to spend time with you when this is all over, man. Well, no. um, all right. Be, be safe. Be yes, blessed. sir. And hey, but being... you got to come down to the beach, though, because I am I know for a fact that whenever this is over, the weather be better here. Uh, well, <laughs> you're right. You're right. And we will come put our feet in the sand. Yes, and, sir. Uh, and play some golf. Or, yes, sir. There. Let's do it. Yeah, We're on. That's what's up. Man. Hey, friend. Thank you for watching Kingdom Renaissance Man with James Hassel. I'm asking you just visit our website at www.hassleministries.org and become a partner today. Help us to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. And don't forget to hit that subscribe, like, and share button.